Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for that uh, rather glowing introduction. I have been listening this morning, and it's been great being here. And uh, I have to say, I endorse so much of what is said, although it's a very different world to my own. But uh, I sometimes feel when these major issues which we've been talking about, and we've been talking about this afternoon, the, the uh, defence of the realm, that architecture is somehow in comparison, in most people's views, um, a fairly fringe uh, issue, and it's not quite so important. And we tend to think that um, somehow or another, what you feel about design and traditional detail is really reserved for the people who have um, time and leisure. <coughs> In a sense, it's true because classical architecture really does need um, a, a country that's at peace and the outlook of reasonable equanimity to be able to continue the going tradition. Well, my subject is why traditional architecture matters and what it means to our culture. I guess that most of you here have a pretty clear idea about what we mean by traditional architecture, but uh, in case some of you are a little vague, I would define it as the way of building that has been handed down to us by our forefathers for generations. And it must be pretty obvious to most of you that nearly everything you see going up around us now is not that sort of architecture. It's just a slightly brighter light here than that. Oh, let's be closer. I won't waste your time um, describing all the differences between traditional and modern architecture. I think most of you know them. But I would emphasize one uh, comparison which is not often uh, emphasized and it is actually vitally important and that is longevity. Because traditional materials, that is load-bearing masonry, stone or brick in, in lime mortar, is the structure, not only of this building which we're in today, but all traditional buildings. And they last for centuries, even in certain cases millennia. Whereas modern buildings and modern materials, steel, glass, uh, reinforced concrete and plastics, uh, Produce a building. Sorry. They produce a building which actually um, doesn't last anything like so long. In fact, generally you, you you rate the age of a modern building in a few decades. Uh, a recent study was done, um, an American study of steel and glass buildings. And it said the useful life of a steel and glass building is 25 years. It can last longer, but sooner or later it will be demolished and all the products and all the materials will be dumped on a landfill site and the whole sad process of rebuilding starts all over again. And the real reason is, and it's amazing how people don't understand this, but the molecular structure of steel and reinforced concrete, not to mention aluminium and uh, plastics and glass, is so high, that is, it expands when the sun comes out and it, it shrinks when it freezes, that you have to put expansion joints every 15 feet into a modern building which is covered with a bit of plastic, and in due course that breaks down and after violence. And then driving rain will enter the, enter the structure, and one way or another, the building won't last. So we're putting up buildings which 
uh, have, a, have a life of a few decades and were turning away from a tradition where our buildings would last centuries. And I think that's a, an amazing difference which people then seem to realise or take into account. But not only that, that sort of architecture uh, has no history and it therefore has no future. So culturally what you're doing is getting rid of a, a, a way of building that's gone on for centuries, replacing it with something which modernists think is terribly exciting for a few years, then they get bored with it, then it comes down and the whole process goes on again. I have many friends from Poland uh, and they were there at the um, uh, when Warsaw was flattened at the end of the war. And they remember also, not only that it was flattened, but that before they built or rebuilt their hospitals or their schools or their blocks of flats, they rebuilt the historic centre of Warsaw, brick by brick and stone by stone. And they said they had to do it because it was their identity. What we're doing is removing our identity. In my view, the man who wrote most wisely about what good architecture means to our culture was Sir Christopher Wren. Few people realise that Wren actually wrote much. He built a lot. But they didn't realise what he wrote. But he wrote this in his Parentalia. Now read it slowly because it's, it's slightly archaic, but I think it sums it up beautifully. He says this, Architecture has its political use. Public buildings, being the ornament of a country, establishes a nation, draws people and commerce, makes people love their native country, which passion is the original of all great actions in a commonwealth. The emulation of the cities of Greece was the true cause of their greatness. The obstinate valour of the Jews, occasioned by the love of their temple, was a cement that held together that people for many ages through infinite changes. And then this great statement. Architecture aims at eternity. And therefore, the only thing incapable of modes and fashions in its principles is the orders by which he means what we now call the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian orders that you can see <coughs> in this building. He goes on The orders are not only Roman and Greek, but Phoenician, Hebrew, and Assyrian being founded on the experience of all ages, promoted by the vast treasures of all great monarchs, and the skill of the greatest artists and geometricians, everyone emulating each other, and the experiments, being of great expense and many errors, is the reason that the principles of architecture are now, and that was the 1660s, are now the study of antiquity rather than fancy. Now clearly Wren had contempt for fancy and a reverence for antiquity. Whereas our modern world, it would seem that the principles of architecture today are the study of fancy and novelty rather than antiquity. What I'd like to do is briefly trace this same theme that Wren describes and see how it has benefited and later deserted Britain. Those classical orders, as Wren says, are more ancient than Rome or Greece. In my view they go back to the Temple of Solomon, but that's the subject of another lecture. But this melodic mind 
that we see after the fall of Rome and after the Dark Ages was revived at the Renaissance by architects like Brunelleschi and Alberti and Romanti and later Palladio all over Northern Italy. And that soon inspired British architects like Inigo Jones and Wren and Hawksmoor and Vanbrugh and Gibbs and Kent and spread to America with Jefferson at Monticello and back in Britain in the 18th and 19th century, Adam, Wyatt, Soane, Barry, even Puget and Street for Gothic is one variation of the classical tradition. And even into the beginning of the 20th century, there were convent architects like Belcher and Hutchins. And then, slowly and sadly, through the 20th century, traditional architecture declined as Britain declined through two world wars and as modernism became the image of their brave new world. An international style where the raison d'etre was, was to do the reverse of what tradition had, both in choice of materials and construction and style. And therefore they erected structures in steel and glass and cement and plastics, wholly independent of the consumption of fossil fuels for the manufacture of all their materials. Steel and concrete require massive quantities of uh, fossil fuels to, just to, to make them, whereas stone you only have to dig it out of the ground. And also in the servicing of their buildings, uh, air conditioning, heating, lighting, lifts, and everything else. And the result today is that no major public buildings are erected in the classical tradition. And that all schools of architecture, we've been hearing about education, all schools of architecture, and all the royal institutions, that's the Royal Institute of British Architects, the Royal Academy, the Royal Fine Art Commission, and all government appointments are totally opposed to the return of Britain's classical tradition. <coughs> Over the last hundred years, we have not built any public spaces comparable with, say, Parliament Square or even Bedford Square or the centres of cities like Bath or Oxford or Cambridge or Edinburgh. <coughs> It has to be said in passing that with the decline of traditional architecture, and this may be just personal, I also observe a parallel decline in art and music and morality and the nation's loyalty to their Christian conviction. And when he died, 
he and I were virtually the only serious classical architects in practice. Now, there are over 40 younger practicing architects in Britain, and there are many more in the US. At Poundbury, as mentioned the Prince of Wales, he uh, is constantly ridiculed by the RIBA, and yet he has employed over 25 traditional, traditionally minded architects, including ourselves, to build what amounts to a traditional small town adjacent to Dorchester. It's not perfect, but it's a king in comparison to what you see going up all around London. I used to make my living designing private houses for those who could afford it down some leafy lane far from the madding crowd. But now we are beginning to move into town centres. It may have taken 25 years for my Richmond Riverside scheme, some of you may know it, to be regarded as a serious alternative to modernism. But we've now been appointed to do Twickenham Riverside and another one or two other developments. I'm now, I suppose, well stricken in years and will probably never see <coughs> any possible revival, but I think there is some hope, and certainly much more hopeful than when I began 55 years ago. And on that note, I suppose really I should end, but I have a short epilogue that's very personal, but I see it running parallel with architecture regarding the far more important subject, whose revival today also seems more unlikely, but it runs parallel to British architecture. And that is British Christianity. And I realise I may be lecturing on the subject of one of our later speakers. But the British traditional architecture, but like British traditional architecture, British Christianity is also the renaissance or revival or reformation of first century Christianity, which is more ancient than Greece and Rome. And again, after the Dark Ages, was rediscovered by divines like John Wycliffe in the 14th century, who inspired Luther and Calvin, who inspired the Scotsman, John Knox, and the English martyrs, Cranmer, Latimer, Ridley, in the 16th century. It was then taken up by poets like Milton and Bunyan, and later, in open, uh, the open air evangelist Wesley and Whitfield spread to America, John Edwards and many others, and back to Britain in the 18th and 19th centuries with men like Simeon and Spurgeon and Cowper and Wilberforce. And of course, the massive British missionary movement to India, China and Africa. And even in the 20th century, there have been many like-minded people who are outstanding but almost unknown. The decline of British Christianity has not been so visible as the decline of traditional architecture. But the effect of the 19th century, the German higher critical movement, people like Kant, Voltaire, and Matthew Arnold, and some of, are some of the causes that have led to this apostasy and the growth of liberalism, which now dominates all the churches today. At present, at present the liberal convictions, uh, those liberal convictions that I say dominate both Catholic and Protestant circles, and the uh, liberals hugely outnumber, like architects, those with, dare I use the word, conservative convictions. 
But again, convictions matter more than others. And there are no signs that the world could turn. I was encouraged by someone who said that liberalism is on the way out. I don't know if you saw the spectator that said feminism is on the way out <laughs> today. But it may surprise you that I recently put galleries into three Anglican churches and are now working on two more to provide space for growing congregations. These churches have only one thing in common with each other. They all swim against the tide of the modernist liberal agenda. And they will not compromise on female ordination or same-sex marriage because they're biblically conservative. They may well have a hard time as Synod deprives them of their buildings, but like the Chinese church, which has grown to over a hundred million thanks to the British missionaries, after 50 years of more intense persecution, they have a glorious future which the liberal establishment never had, never had, nor ever will. So, surrounded by gloom and doom in our modern culture, there is still a certain hope of a far better future. And I begin to see signs of it this side of the grave. Thank you.